Our next speaker is Steve Goodman. He's Associate Dean of Clinical and Translational Research and Professor of Medicine and of Health Research and Policy at Stanford. Steve's co-director of the Meta Research Inno Innovation Center at Stanford, or Metrics, a group dedicated to examining and improving the reproducibility and efficiency of scientific research. He's vice chair of the Methodology Committee of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, where he leads their open science and data sharing efforts. Steve has served on numerous Institute of Medicine committees, including one on sharing data from clinical trials, whose report was released in January of this year. Thanks, and thanks for uh, including me in this uh, conversation. Um, so yeah, my, uh, you're going to see my bio on the next slide. Um, the, uh, I'll be talking about specifically the sharing of clinical trial data. Uh, but the comments uh, I make, I think, are going to be applicable to, you're going to see quite a lot of overlap with what's been already been uh, spoken about, and also about health data in general. See if we can figure this out. So um, I'll be speaking uh, from a, a number of perspectives, and uh, uh, some of the roles that Amy just mentioned uh, are important because e they represent different stakeholders in this community. And, and if the whole community is not working together, towards this end, it's not going to work. Uh, so, you know, I started out as a clinical trialist. Uh, I came here from Hopkins, where I was for about 25 years. Uh, I've also served as, a, and, and do serve as a, a, a statistical editor for the Annals of Internal Medicine, it's a big uh, general medical journal. And we, we issued the first reproducible research attempt, and I'll describe that and, and why it hasn't gone too far. Uh, as she mentioned, at PCORI, uh, uh, they're trying to establish an open science policy, the IOM, Clinical Trials Data Sharing Report, uh, and um, most recently the metrics, uh, which is an attempt to wrap our arms around this field of how do we uh, ensure the reliability of what's being concluded and published in the medical literature. I'm particularly delighted to see almost everybody speak on the program today as an affiliate faculty. If you're not, I'm going to be after you uh, right after the meeting. And if you're not speaking but you're interested in this, uh, please contact me too. Uh, most recently, actually, I'm, I'm sitting on a, an, uh, an advisory committee to, to Francis Collins on the future of the NLM. And uh, this actually, this issue of how data are curated and how the National Library of Medicine can situate itself as a, as a major player and continue to be a more, yet more potent force in, in um, helping to uh, establish the, the reliability of the medical literature is a central question going forward. So I'll be reflecting on each of these perspectives as, as I talk. So some very recent history. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a test. Does, does this iconography, does this, does anybody in this room know what this is? Nobody. Okay. So this shows we have a heterogeneous audience. Um, so this is one of the very first uh, individual patient data meta-analyses. This was for tamoxifen in breast cancer. This was published in 1988, and it's from a collaboration called the Early Breast Cancer um, Trialist Collaborative that has been put together over many, 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 many years with the brute force charisma and uh, leverage of Richard Pito. And this has been a fantastically generative and productive collaboration where all the trialists in the world who do study and in treatment of breast cancer pool uh, agree to share their data, their individual patient data. And this gives you an example of what the power of that is. Every You will note that every single one of these studies has, so here's the line of no effect. This is the squares where the, the relative risk to the left effect. Every single study by itself shows a non-significant uh, result. And yet at the end of the day, uh, the effect of tamoxifen in reducing mortality from early breast cancer is a highly significant 23 percent reduction. Down here it's a 20 percent uh, reduction that you get out of pooling the data. And this is not just the published data, but the individual patient data. This particular collaboration has been enormously fruitful. These are, the, 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 that study is right at the very top, but you see they've been publishing paper almost every year since 1988, and this continues. But this is the result of a fantastic amount of work by a highly visible, uh, uh, you know, clinical trialist and, and meta-analyst. And the idea is, can we um, yield the, the, the kind of results you have here with, it, with a model for data sharing that is not 
on the basis of one-on-one -on -one relationships and particular groups uh, getting together. So this is some of the benefits of data sharing. Oh, it continues up right to the present day, as you will see, almost every year. So th remember that these, these trialists are publishing their own papers at the same time, so they're getting credit. But as a, as a community, uh, medicine itself is getting the benefit of this collective, um, of these collective um, data. The other thing to think, uh, to be aware of is that these data are from trials going back decades. So in the, the, the data from trials that are being, that were done in the late 70s and 80s are still being used today. The mammography uh, uh, the controversy that you hear flare up every two to three years is still using trials from the 60s. So, you know, this is the, now that is data over 50 years old. So we can't, the, the science in, in the clinical trial world is not over, does not expire in the last two years. Now, there have been many uh, drivers for this movement, not just because of the benefits, but because of the harms of not sharing. And uh, these probably won't ring all the bell, everyone won't ring bells here. But uh, these are controversies uh, about safety of drugs that have almost all been due to lack of um, uh, sharing or visibility of the primary data. FenFen, Vioxx, Avandia, uh, bone morphogenic protein, that was actually a scandal that, that started here, that is its resolution started here. Tamiflu and a debacle at Duke, which is an which is a, uh, object lesson in itself. And each one of these could be an hour long talk about the lessons that it taught us. Um, here's the figure that appeared in the, in JAMA for the um, cumulative uh, percentage of, uh, of, of complications due to Vioxx at six months, you see that the Vioxx curve, which is in red, is way below the others, and this was central to the claim that this was a preferable um, uh, um, uh, pain drug uh, in arthritis and in other, uh, and in other uh, conditions. Uh, but what the editors didn't know and the readers didn't know was that they, the company had in hand the 12-month data, and that's what was found, and this resulted in institution of policies. This got the editor of JAMA very, very, very angry uh, and resulted in policies uh, having to do with reanalysis of all drug company data by independent statisticians, which has since been repealed because it didn't actually work. Um, here's a story you might not know of. Uh, you, you probably know the, 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 uh, the uh, claim. Uh, this was recently highlighted in the news by Julia um, oh, Moore, Julianne Moore, who won the Oscar. This is, this is a particular painful story for me for reasons I'll be clear in a minute. She said, I read an article that said winning an Oscar could lead, lead to living five years longer. If that's true, I'd really like to thank the Academy because my husband is younger than me. So actually, it's very funny. Uh, and I'm glad that she said something like, if that's true. She had more caveats there than a lot of the news articles on this repeated every year. And it's actually, which repeated, and it's actually based on a, a study that appeared in the, in, uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine from 2001, a study that we didn't uh, actually 100% trust. And uh, I, I won't tell the whole story except to say that we wanted the data put on the web. Um, and it did appear on the web uh, for one day, the day that this appeared. It then disappeared, and other people who were very exercised by this tried to get that data for the next five years, and finally, when one did, they reanalyzed it to find that, indeed, it wasn't a four-year highly statistically significant um, uh, advantage. It was a 0.7 non-statistically significant <laughs> advantage, in fact, no advantage at all. This has been picked up by a few uh, news outlets, uh, such as this one, but every year we see it again. It's just grinding it in our faces. Uh, and I don't know if this is literally a raging scientific debate, but it just shows, uh, again, the, the importance of seeing the original data uh, for outrageous claims. Now, getting on the more serious side, this is a uh, curve um, of studies that were published, uh, published uh, clinical trial, uh, the cohort of, of randomized control trials that were published, that were funded by the NHLBI, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, um, over time. And uh, you see it plateaus at about, you know, 60%, 65, you know, 65% after many, many years. So that's at 60% at five years, five years. So this is clinical trials. This is clinical trials, the stuff that is arguably the most urgent to get out there. This is the NIH-funded clinical trials, arguably the highest profile. 40% are not being published after, uh, uh, are not being published as of five years. 
Um, this is a real, real serious problem. There's also evidence that what is published is very selective. The outcomes we, we see are sometimes chosen. The um, subgroups are carefully chosen, and, and they often deviate from primary uh, protocols. Uh, I, I could go, you know, if I had a longer talk, uh, you would see much more evidence of this. This is related to FDA. Uh, this just came out, and maybe some of you saw the news coverage. Uh, the FDA has in its hands uh, the um, clinical trial data that shows that what's published is wrong. And yet they are not, they say they're not by law allowed to release it. Um, now, obviously, the people who are publishing these trials are allowed to release it. And we have, obviously, a serious structural problem as well as a reporting problem uh, here. And this is, uh, this is just published uh, last month. Um, a bone morphogenic protein, this was a, um, a, a, a series of problems where this particular protein for spinal fusion was promulgated as an answer to um, some of our ills. And uh, the editor of the Spine Journal, who's here at Stanford, uh, noticed that the uh, side effects being reported to the FDA, none of them were, were appearing in the medical literature. In fact, it was being reported as having essentially zero side effects. This eventually, all the data was turned over uh, to an independent group. It was meta-analyzed by two completely independent teams, uh, and they published two completely parallel papers on exactly the same data. And interestingly, they didn't come up with identical conclusions, which tells you about science, too. Um, but they at least came up with co conclusions that were coherent with the actual data. And then we published an editorial in, in Annals. We actually created two completely separate editorial teams to deal with these um, papers so there wouldn't be any cross-contamination of any information. So what are some of the benefits of clinical trial sharing? Well, um, first, that other investigators can reproduce the published findings and carry out additional analysis. This increases confidence. In the existing reports, it leads to new ideas for research and, and often actually new research, that is, uh, uh, answer questions not addressed originally through either exploration of subgroups or linkage with other data sets, could be gene data, I mean, you name it, the, 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 the kinds of science that you can create today through unexpected connect, you know, linkages between data sets is really uh, unbelievable. And it avoids uh, unnecessarily duplicative trials because if information doesn't get out there, what happens is new studies are mounted. Um, it also decreases data unavailable for analysis. Uh, if people are putting their raw data out, arguably, you don't necessarily need the paper. So if they don't think it's dangerous, if they don't think it's publishable, maybe you think it's publishable or maybe you can include it in a meta-analysis. Strengthens the evidence base, increases scientific knowledge gained from work of the clinical trialists, and of, most importantly, and I think this is often ignored, that it maximizes the contributions of participants. And certainly if the study, the data is not available at all, that's like taking the measurement. I mean, would we draw blood from somebody, have them sit down for an hour with a questionnaire, put them through a machine, take the report, and throw it in the garbage in front of them? Would we do that? I mean, that, that's what we're doing when this stuff doesn't get out there. And, and we're talk, I'm talking about the most extremes, doesn't get out there at all. And, and we wouldn't do that. We, you know, board, we've, we wouldn't be arrested. We might be barred from our institution. And yet that's what goes on, actually, on a pretty routine basis. Um, and it happens both in academia and in industry. In academia, although it has different, uh, different priorities and different pressures, is no less culpable and no less problematic, in fact, in many ways, more problematic than, than industry. Uh, why is clinical trial data sharing hard? Well, a lot of these uh, issues have been already broached. First of all, there are concerns about privacy, confidentiality, and consent. Uh, the data is very complex. I'll talk about that in a minute. It minimizes the return on investment of the investigator. That is, they spend a lot of time, a lot of money uh, getting this data. John mentioned this just a moment ago. Uh, and what's their incentive? And they want to mine it for a long time, uh, or at least that's what they say. In fact, the vast, as we see, a lot of studies aren't published at all. The vast majority of studies only published once, only have one publication. Very, very few go beyond two. So this notion that they can be mined and mined and mined forever with, with a, is false with a few signal examples. And of course, one of the advantages of, of more universal sharing is that if you
and it's um, very expensive financially. I, I can't say it's necessarily more expensive per data point than some of the other scientific endeavors, but it, it certainly, if you include the, the human price, it might be. Very hard to conduct a repeat. Uh, again, this isn't necessarily unique. There's very strong regulatory and ethical oversight, and the societal permission is based on trust that you can conduct these experiments, that patients and their data are treated with respect, and that permission can be withdrawn at any time. And, and this is something that, that, that is very important to remember, that, that, the, that the social trust fabric on which clinical trials, trust, clinical trials are based is very, very fragile. We, we take it for, for, for granted that we can just go out and do these things, and we can do other sort, forms of research without that. But one bad thing that happens to one patient in a clinical trial, if it's seen as demonstrative of a lack of caring or a lack of care of the institution, can, can uh, bring the whole thing down. And this is one thing that happened at my, my former institution as a result of the death of just one patient. One patient on a clinical trial shut down everything. And this happened at a lot of institutions uh, in, in, the, in the 90s. At Duke, uh, I think it was at St. Jude, um, a number. And, and they, the, the particular incidents that occurred in each place was in some way taken as diagnostic or emblematic of, of the fact that the institution didn't have adequately, uh, oh, let me see, I'll just put it right there, uh, adequate safety or regulatory uh, oversight. So this was in spite of the fact that the, the, this research wasn't just research, it was treatment. I mean, these people were on protocols. This is how they were getting, many of them, particularly cancer patients, getting the treatment. There was demonstrable harm done from the shutdown. But that was, not, that was not sufficient to keep the research going. And, and this particular shutdown lasted for about 10 days. And that was not, uh, and that was everything. That was absolutely everything. Can you imagine doing that here? Well, Hopkins is five times bigger. So um, it's a big deal. So what has been the responses to these problems? Well, lots and lots of calls of sharing data. There's a New England Journal article. Um, and obviously, it's gotten the uh, attention of the leadership in the NIH. And there's, uh, this is a piece published last year by Francis Collins and uh, Larry Tabak, uh, where they're taking a number of steps to, um, first of all, most importantly, acknowledge uh, that there's a reproducibility problem, but start to develop some very concrete tools. And among, I think, the most important, uh, which relates to points before, is the development of a data discovery index, which is. Uh, uh, an ability to give people credit in the same way they get credit through citations through uh, if their data is shared and, and reused. Uh, and there are a lot of other things there, but I'm not going to go through it today. Now, are data shared very often? Well, no. This is a survey, and uh, this is a big, big problem, and I'll come back to this when I talk about PCORI. So the current situation is increasing pressure uh, on industry, on government, on uh, research funders to make clinical trial data available to other researchers and or the public. And there are a bunch of ad hoc policies that have emerged, uh, but there's no agreement on the model, and that's one of the big problems right now. So this was one of the motivations for this IOM committee, which was set up in 2013, whose report was just issued uh, in January. And some of the things that they had to deal with were, were the elements of data sharing policies, which go way beyond the technical mentions we've talked about. Who are the providers of the data? Who are the recipients? When should it be shared? What data is shared? What's the purpose of data sharing? What are the conditions of use? How might it be shared? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the cover of the report. And one of the things that the report dealt with was, as Christine spoke to, is what are data? And I'll just show one slide that just amplifies uh, what she, what she uh, showed us. It can be the raw data, the abstracted data, the, the coded data, the computerized data, the clean data, the calculated data, the analyzable data, and the analyzed data. So all of these things, and yet there are probably yet more categories. We drew our line actually roughly here in terms of what's shared. That is, this would be shared, not necessarily all this on an automatic basis. And the reasons for that are uh, logistical. So here's an example of something close to raw data. could get rawer than this. This is a survey that was um, issued by some colleagues of mine trying to get at uh, drug use, uh, particularly marijuana. And you see this is a particular uh, person who is actually extremely well known, but fortunately they didn't share that title, that person's name with me. That's, that would be a violation. Said, so, have you ever smoked marijuana? Yes. What age did you start? 21. Do you still smoke? No. When did you quit? 26. Okay, so remember that. So first of all, that's 
for this data is the raw data. Okay, so these are the codes appearing to the right. One, yes, is one. So, you know, you have to remember it. So somewhere in a code book, it has to say yes equals one, right? Okay, 21, 0, 26. Okay, very clear. Okay, let's go to the next page. It gets a little more de detailed. Okay, at each age, how often did you smoke marijuana? Less than 15, 15 to 19, never. 20 to 29, one to three times a month. 30 to 39, ooh, one to 11 times a year. 45, ooh, ooh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy stopped at 26 years old. So what do you get here? It says set to 99 to be consistent. So what they do is they code it as missing. So this is the coded data. So how, if this was critical, how would you know? Only if you went back to the raw data forms. So this is, you know, sometimes very, very, very important changes are made uh, in, between the raw data. This is a manuscript published in the New England Journal uh, the, called the, it was the CAMP trial. There were 73 manuscript tables and nine figures that were in, in back of this manuscript, but published were three and two, went through 40 revisions. What do you share and what are you seeing when you see that publication? Almost nothing. Okay, metadata. Well, I've already heard a little about this. Uh, without metadata, it's difficult to use or interpret other data. Um, in clinical trials, the metadata at a minimum is the full protocol and amendments, the manual of operations, the statistical analysis plan, the amendments, the codes, and the software. Okay. So New England Journal says they share the c protocol. Great. Terrific. Actually, it's very, very hard to get protocols. This is not, uh, and, and, and it's not stored at clinicaltrials.gov. So here's a study, and I uh, found this just before I gave another talk on this area and uh, wanted to see what the New England Journal had. So if you go into the appendiceal material for this article, there, protocol. This trial, trial protocol has been provided by the authors to give readers additional information about their work. So I clicked on this, and this is what appears. If anybody can. So what do you do when you get a protocol like that, which just shows, I mean, literally, translation is a problem. So I ran it through Google Translate. What do you do? Okay, so this is what you get. The previously Dirsch, Kefert, and randomized trials <laughs> comparing immediately PCI anyway. A study had statistically because no meaningful figures are canceled. <laughs> so actually, I originally showed this. Uh, I searched for this for, before a talk I gave a couple years ago. And I showed this, and absolutely nobody laughed. Why? It, it was a talk in Freiburg, Germany. So <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> Everybody did speak English. Um, so anyway, we have this graphic in the report which shows the complexity of what are the data. We have this abstracted code or whatever. But even here in the analyzed data set, it's a very complex data structure. This is where we sort of draw the line. But uh, you know, in if interested people can read the report. But this issue of exactly what's to be shared and how to share it is uh, very complicated. So the highlight, to highlight the the, the um, recommendations, the most important thing is that the recommendations had to address each one of these stakeholders, the participants, to give adequate consent, the funders, the sponsors, the regulatory agencies, the investigators, research institutions, journals, and professional societies. The the system, the sharing system, won't work unless every one of these entities is pulling in the same direction because anyone can undermine it. If the funder doesn't require it, it's not going to get done. If the journals let you uh, uh, publish stuff where you're not going to share the data, it won't get done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's creating a culture with the self-reinforcing culture to counter all the forces that currently all go in the direction of not sharing. Um, this report does not, um, will not all by itself solve it. And then there is a, a, uh, a timeline for release of data, which got the most uh, attention in the report, although I think actually the other elements were more important. And this said you should release the data in the primary publication no less than six months after the primary publication, but, under, but, but release all the data, publishing or not, no less than a year and a half after the study is over. So this summarizes some of those um, recommendations. I'll just paraphrase them. This says we have to foster a culture in which data sharing is the expected norm and for funders promote a sustainable infrastructure and mechanism by which data can be shared, funding to investigators, include prior data sharing as a condition for future uh, funding decisions, fund and promote development and adoption of common, common data elements. This is just a small 
piece. I'm not going to read through everything. There were recommendations for every one of these players for every one of the recommendations. Second recommendation um, it had to do with the timeline, and the third had to do with um, uh, mitigating the harms and, and benefits through data use agreements and consents and uh, uh, use of uh, intermediaries. I do want to highlight the, the one or two of the questions that have occurred at PCORI in wanting to put forward an open science policy, and this again relates to questions that were brought up here uh, by Christine. The number one question is, what percent of funds should be allocated to data sharing versus new research? It's a zero-sum game. If we allocate 5% to data sharing, we say line item in the budget, that's 5% less for research. 10%, 10% less for research. And then this question comes up, well, how do we know it's even going to be used? And we, in fact, we know ahead of time that most of, this, most of the, the clinical trial data will not be used. Will not, they, they will not be requested for sharing. So the question is then, do we create a just-in-time system where people are prepared for data sharing and release it at the time of the request, or do we do it for everybody and it's required? And, and these are real resource questions when, you know, uh, money is tight as it is uh, right now. One point I, I'd like to make that came through very clearly in our deliberations, and this re uh, underscores something that Brian said, is that if folks do the kinds of things that they should be doing that's part of good science and good data management as part of doing their science, do, preparing it for data sharing, 90 percent of your work is already done. A lot of the costs are already incurred. So that, that gets to another issue, which is we're going to fund data sharing. What are we funding? Are we just funding good data management? And if so, that should be part of the primary budget. That should not be part of the data sharing budget that, oh, we will have a code book that says what the variable names mean. That, that's part of good data sharing that anybody can use for 5, 10, maybe 10,000 years. I don't know. Um, so these questions, when we talk to the funders, are, are very, very real, and we haven't resolved them right now. The other one at PCORI, which is, we, and we want to institute the policy tomorrow, but what we can't tell them tomorrow is, well, where do you put your data? We, we don't have a solution for that yet. On their own website, not everybody has Stanford Digital Libraries. This is actually a very tough question. So where do things stand? I didn't talk about the journals. Um, the journals are actually sort of slowly moving, but the problem is it's a, it's a problem of collective action. We, we issued a, a reproducible data sharing, a reproducible research data sharing policy at Annals Internal Medicine about four years ago, but what we couldn't do was require it. Why couldn't we require it? Because as soon as we require it, that's a speed bump that they don't have it in the New England Journal and that they don't have it at JAMA and that they don't have it at Lancet. They'll go immediately there. It's a competitive environment. So unless all the journals move together, as they did in child registration, no one journal can do it alone, and it's not the highest priority right now. They're dealing with other things. So the journals are a little bit, you know, walking in quicksand together. For Corey, the issues are costs and where to put it. Uh, the IOM has issued its report, but I would say it, it established, it may, maybe got us 20 percent of the way, and there's a huge amount of work. It basically said what we need to work on. And, and what we should work on together. And metrics, well, we're trying both to track this, but also to try to think about things we can do at Stanford, things we can do right here to help do this. And we will hear from Russ and we heard from Brian. They're working in their domains. But if any of you have thoughts about how to, uh, things we might do uh, or ways to work in your domains or we can help you, uh, we would love to hear about it. So with that, I'll finish. Thanks. Christine, yes. You can take mine. Thank you, Stephen. That is the most concise summary of one of the hardest data sharing problems in the world I have, I have heard. Well, thank you for calling it concise. <laughs> it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the most compelling case and the most problematic at the same time. Um, it seems that medical schools have not been better at any, than any other graduate training in inculcating data management skills and, and open data and open science than at any place else. If is there a sweet spot there? Can we embed in medical education these kinds of data management expertise? So I'm going to modify your question. Sure. Medical education is not the place, for the most part, that we can really teach research. Um, we can teach a little bit, um, but it's it's in all the training programs we have for researchers that we have to do a better job. 
and increasingly this is being, you know, curricula are being developed as we speak, both our center and also the NIH, I just sat on a study section, they are trying to develop on online modules and that was also announced in that Collins piece and they're, they will be announcing probably in a few months a uh, number of centers that will be um, uh, developing teaching tools. There are also a lot of teaching tools online. I, I think that both in the basic sciences and the clinical uh, research space, there's a there is a gap in the education uh, of how to uh, proper data curation management and, and a lot of things related to reproducibility. I know Russ, who's going about to speak, has developed, has developed a course that he's starting to teach here. But these courses are, are far and few between. So I, I think in increasing uh, the research, this as a part of core research training, not just knowing what a t-test and a chi-squared is, but knowing actually how to manage data in a way that you understand it later not, and, and somebody else can understand it later, and knowing how to properly interpret uh, your findings, uh, there's actually a huge problem there that we haven't even gone into here. So yes, I, I think there's a, a lot, big opportunity and, uh, and a big problem that currently exists in the research training education. Thank you.